chapter 52. A biome is a big, big ecosystem, and it has very similar vegetation throughout the entire ecosystem. The physical environment is very similar, um, has very similar rainfall and uh, temperature throughout the ecosystem. So if you look at this graph, we're looking at um, rainfall compared to, or precipitation could be snow, um, compared to temperature. And so if you look at this part, here's a desert, and you'll notice that it has very, very little precipitation, and it's uh, you know, got a, a pretty high temperature, um, at least sometimes. And you can consider Arctic areas sometimes to be deserts if the rainfall is very low, but um, this graph is showing just the, the warmer areas to be deserts. If you have a little bit more rainfall, there you have a grassland, and it's still um, pretty warm at least in some parts. If you go way over here, here's a tropical forest. And so the tropical forest is very, it's got a very um, narrow range of temperature and um, you can have a whole lot of rainfall and then it would be a tropical rainforest. And you could have a lot less rainfall and then it would be a tropical dry forest where sometimes it rains a lot and sometimes it rains not so much. Here's um, a forest which needs more rainfall than a grassland. And here's a coniferous forest. So these are uh, more of, um, you know, conifers. So pine trees, um, as opposed to the deciduous trees, the ones that lose their leaves that you would find more of here. And so there's certainly some overlap in a lot of these, but you need to understand that the general thing that makes a biome a biome is the amount of precipitation and the amount of temperature. And so we're gonna talk about some biomes in this video and you don't need to memorize which biome is which, you just need to understand this picture right here. Rainfall and temperature determine the biome. So there are a few things about biomes that we'll talk about. Um, we'll talk about terrestrial biomes compared to aquatic biomes. A terrestrial biome is one that's on land. And so terrestrial means land. You should definitely have that vocab down. And they usually kind of grade into each other. I would not memorize echo tone. You don't really need to know that one. Okay, vertical layering, we, we do want to talk about a little bit. Um, the canopy layer is, you know, high up in the trees, and sometimes there are trees that go above that, certainly. Um, an understory layer is here, and then there's the forest floor, and actually even underneath the forest floor. And so there are different ecosystems for different organisms, and so you can have organisms that spend most of their time up in the trees, and they might not even see the organisms down here much. And so the layering of this vegetation gives diverse habitats to different animals. Another thing that I want you to uh, pay attention to here is the convergent evolution. This is something that we won't talk about uh, for quite a while when we get to the evolution unit, but it's important. So when you converge, you come together, right? So you start from very different places. And so these will be an ancestor for this one, an ancestor for this one. When these are exposed to the same selective pressures, they'll end up looking alike. So these two plants really are not very closely related at all, uh, but they end up looking very, very much the same because they're the, the same things are selected for. So having a very small surface area compared to the volume would be selected for so that they don't lose too much water. Um, and having some kind of sharp spines to prevent themselves from being eaten is, is another um, selective pressure. And so just keep this in the back of your mind as you go through the course. Disturbance and terrestrial biomes. A disturbance is an event, um, often it's some kind of human activity. It can be a fire or a storm though, something that's not necessarily human activity, and it will change the community. Um, so for example, some grasslands have frequent regular fires, and when humans stop the fires from happening, the, um, the whole biome, um, the plants in it change a bit. So now what we're going to do is talk about different types of terrestrial biomes. And again, get the gist of this. You do not need to memorize one compared to another. This is a tropical rainforest, and tropical rainforests tend to have lots of um, water, and it's a, a pretty consistent amount of water, and they tend to be um, really warm. And so you can see on the map where they end up being like pretty much uh, around the equator. Here's a desert, and so the main thing that you need to know about deserts is that they have very little rainfall, and they can be pretty cold, actually, um, at night, but they, they tend to be um, pretty hot during the day, although, you know, not always. 
here's a savanna. A savanna has lots of grasses and um, usually herbs like flowering um, annual plants. And um, the temperature is really warm in a savanna. And so you can check out the places on the, on the globe where you find savannas. Chaparral is um, a place that's um, pretty hot, but it also can get pretty cold. So it has some, some seasons and um, there are some trees here and um, shrubs and um, lots of herbs. Grasslands tend to have, um, they're a little bit colder than the savanna and um, they can get pretty hot in the summertime and they can get pretty cold. So you find those a little bit maybe further north than what we've seen with some of the others, a little bit further south, a little bit further away from the equator. And they have less rainfall than they do in, than you, than you get in a forest. So here's a forest. Notice um, lots and lots of these conifers. And um, they live there. This is pretty far north typically. And they get usually quite a bit of rainfall. Here's a broadleaf forest. So these are deciduous trees generally that lose their leaves. And it's, a, it's also got a lot of rain compared to a grassland, but it's um, warmer than a coniferous forest. So, you know, typically less snow. Here's tundra. This is um, where it's very, very cold. So it's gonna be, you know, up near the Arctic. And um, typically you have um, permafrost. So the soil is um, frozen permanently. Um, precipitation is usually pretty low um, if we're looking at Arctic tundra, but if you're looking at tundra that's um, on the mountaintops, it might be actually quite a bit of rain. So that's really, I, I wouldn't memorize any of those. You just kind of need to know that it's precipitation and, um, and temperature that sets one terrestrial biome apart from another. Aquatic biomes, you need to know that aquatic means water. And you'll see marine sometimes. Marine means it's got salt water, so um, sea or ocean. Aquatic biomes don't have quite as much um, temperature variation as terrestrial biomes because water has a, um, a high specific heat, which just means that it takes a lot of energy to change its temperature. So freshwater biomes have very little salt in them. And um, they're very closely linked to the terrestrial biome. The water will run off of the land and, and end up in the water. And I wouldn't memorize parts of these, but what you should understand, um, this photic zone right here, this is the area that light penetrates to. So there's a lot of photosynthesis that's gonna be happening here. Whereas underneath that, um, you don't get much light penetration. And so you're gonna have less photosynthesis. Anything that's produced up here will fall down here though and get um, decomposed in this area. And so a lot of times aquatic biomes are stratified. And I just said this, sorry. So the photic zone and the aphotic zone just named based on how much light they get. Um, I wouldn't again, memorize any of these, but um, the pelagic zone is the entire um, place with water as opposed to sediment. Um, I don't know if you need to memorize necessarily all of these either, but the sediments have another region and that's because you're gonna have different organisms there. And so they like to name each part because you're gonna find different um, oxygen levels and, and levels of um, decomposition and, and organisms, what have you in these areas. So I wouldn't memorize any of these terms. Um, detritus, I think you probably should know that because it comes up a lot. So this is any dead organic matter. And so there are detrivores that will eat this stuff like mushrooms, for example, in a terrestrial um, ecosystem. And um, there's, you know, bacteria or whatever that will also break down um, anything dead. Thermocline, so thermo means temperature. And so this is um, a boundary that's going to separate out the warm from colder water. So if you look right here, here's the thermocline. And so up here would be warmer and down here would be colder. And so there's a separation in the summertime. Um, and then in um, there's usually something called turnover that um, will sometimes happen where the water mixes. And so the water here will um, cool and become more dense and fall um, down. And then the water here will come up. And so this is going to have more nutrients in it when it comes up. And anyway, it tends to turn over in the spring and the um, fall. 
And really there's not a lot to memorize with that for, for the AP bio test. I think um, eutrophic is a, a term I would memorize. So oligotrophic are lakes that are nutrient poor and generally oxygen rich. So this would be an um, oligotrophic lake as opposed to this one, eutrophic. So eutrophic is nutrient rich and if you might think that that's really good, right? But what happens is that um, lots of um, organic matter can grow there and then fall to the bottom and then the decomposers use the oxygen that's there to break them down. And so these end up being pretty low in oxygen. And so you end up not being able to support a lot of fish in a in an area like in a, a lake like this. And so these are naturally occurring um, types of lakes. Lakes can become um, more eutrophic though based on um, stuff that people do. So if there's a farm here or um, a lawn and phosphorus and nitrogen get on, into the lake, it's gonna cause really um, very fast um, eutrophication. And so that can be bad because you'll end up building up, um, you know, you'll have grasses and other um, growth. And then when they die, um, they'll fall to the bottom, they'll get decayed, they'll deplete the oxygen. And you can actually have layers built up so that you actually end up filling in the entire lake after, you know, not so long. Okay, wetland is a habitat that has um, standing water for at least some of the time. And we've destroyed lots and lots of wetlands um, because we want to build houses and other, um, you know, other buildings. And um, it's a problem because wetlands are really good at reducing flooding. They slow down um, water moving over land and um, they help to purify the water as it moves through the system as well. An estuary is a transition between the sea and um, fresh water. And these are very nutrient rich uh, typically and really productive. So you, they're sometimes um, a place where fish will go to lay their eggs um, and other animals. Um, here's another estuary. An intertidal zone is an area that's um, sometimes covered by, by the ocean and sometimes not as the tides are going in and out. And so the animals and, and plants adapted to this zone are really, really special because they have to be able to live where it's dry and live where they're covered in water. Um, the, you know, lots and lots of um, different challenges to living in this area. So these are some examples of organisms that can live in the intertidal zone. Um, so here are barnacles. They can, they can handle it when it gets dry, when the water goes out, and they can handle it when they're completely submerged, when the water comes in. Um, things like crabs, they can you know, move in, out, in and out and they can deal with um, being covered with water. Um, and then you'll see the kelp that'll grow um, down here. And so you don't need to memorize any of these parts, but just be familiar with them. Coral reefs, um, these are formed from coral, which are actually animals. They almost are like a, an upside down um, jellyfish. And uh, they build a calcium carbonate skeleton for themselves. And um, they're a really nice um, block um, of the ocean for the, the land that's um, on the other side of them. And um, they're having a hard time uh, making it um, because the, the, well, there's a couple of things going on. One is that the um, water is getting warmer um, with global warming. And so they have to adapt to that and it's having, happening too fast for their adaptation a lot of times. And another thing is there's more, cal there's more um, acid in the, in the water because there's more CO2. Um, when that dissolves in the water, it becomes, um, it, it acidifies the um, water. And so calcium carbonate skeletons are really hard to make when the water is acidic. So our coral reefs are um, absolutely in trouble. And they're also in trouble because as the water level rises, they may not grow fast enough um, as the ocean levels rise. Okay, hydrothermal vents, last thing about aquatic ecosystems. These live, uh, these are, um, at the, at the bottom of the ocean sometimes where you don't have any sunlight at all and you have these really, really incredible communities that live there. And so there are bacteria that are chemosynthetic. And so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but what does it mean? Um, photosynthetic means you use, or an organism uses sunlight to synthetic to produce carbon-based um, compounds, you know, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, stuff like that. Um, you know, starting with sugar, but then converting it into other stuff. 
um, chemo means you're not using sunlight. So this stuff, they, these grow um, in the dark, they way down at the bottom of the ocean, and they might use um, hydrogen sulfide, for example, and um, get energy from the hydrogen sulfide in the um, in the hydrothermal vents. And from there, those bacteria might live into these in these tube um, worms. And then there's going to be crabs that will eat the tube worms. You can see, I think that's a crab right here. That's pretty cool. Um, these symbiotic bacteria a lot of times live in tube worms or um, they have a symbiotic relationship with the clams or the mussels, a mutualistic um, association. Uh, 